Welcome back. Just uh, wanted to just quickly touch base. And before we jump into this price elasticity of demand and wanted, wanted to make sure that I may sound a little jaded sometimes when it when it comes to to talking about healthcare and 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 I guess the relationships that that patients have with their healthcare providers. So, but I've worked in healthcare as I said for thirty years on both the provider side and then the health plan side, and I just want to make sure everybody understands that there's there's different levels of of expertise across all providers. And there's some excellent providers out there. Uh, and there's some out there that may not be as, as good as the others. So just uh, just go into your doctor's office with an open mind, try to work with them, you know, be as honest as possible up front. And um, that tends to help work through some of the asymmetric information issues that we talked about. But I would definitely recommend that if, if especially when it comes to elective surgeries, um, maybe some uh, cancer type treatments or along those lines, it, it doesn't, it never hurts to get a second opinion. So just with that in mind, we'll, we'll jump into uh, kind of the price elasticity of demand. And if you, if you don't remember from your micro classes, um, you know, elasticity, and, and there's, there's a lot of, them. there's price elasticity of demand, there's, you know, income elasticity of demand, there's cross price elasticity, there's several different ways of, of looking at that elasticity of demand, but we're going to focus mostly on price because that's what most people are used to dealing with. And it basically, it, it's the responsiveness of consumers to a change in price uh, and the quantity of healthcare goods and services demanded for a 1% change in the price of healthcare. And it's it's typically negative because uh, as you remember from your from your micro classes, the demand curve is it it's downwards, it's a downward sloping curve. And that's because uh, at lower prices, more quantity is demanded. At higher prices, less quantity is demanded. So your demand curve sloping downward. And typically it's um it, you know, as I say, typically there's always issues where it, it might not slope downward. There are some uh, vertical demand curves and there's some horizontal demand curves, but you know, for the most part, it slopes downward. And because it's negative, a lot of economists will, will drop the negative sign because when you're looking at percentage change, again, now when we're talking about last tissue, you're not talking about the slope of the demand curve. You're talking about the percentage changes along that demand curve. So it's it's downward slope and it's, you know, the elasticity number is going to be negative. And a lot of economists will will drop uh, the negative sign because if the elasticity number is one, then it's what they call unilasticity. And that means that uh, the elasticity of one, a 1% you know, change in price is going to be a 1% change in quantity demanded. If it's elastic, think of elastic kind of like a rubber band. So if it's elastic, it's going to be greater than one. So for a 1% change in the price of healthcare goods or services, it's going to increase the quantity demanded more than one. And if it's less than one, it's going to be inelastic. So that's just when we're talking about the elasticity of demand, it it's it gives individuals, especially on the provider side, it gives them an idea of how they can price their healthcare goods and services if they want to change their total revenue. Um, and on the health plan side, it's going to give them an idea of you know what kind of rates to negotiate or, or what kind of rates to purchase healthcare goods and services at. And it'll it'll kind of it it, it helps both the providers and the health plans understand what drives total revenue and total expenditures. For the most part, consumers, you, me, all other consumers, probably will never realize the true price of a healthcare good or service. Again, been in the healthcare marketplace long enough, I have a pretty good idea. I understand how 
contracts are structured. I understand how pricing is done. I've done a lot of pricing for contracts in the past. I've negotiated contracts in the past. So I understand how the contracts are structured and how the pricing um, is impacted both on the payer side and on the provider side. But the normal, but the, I don't say run of, but the average consumer may not have that information. Again, it goes back to asymmetric information. Um, consumers, you know, talking about when we talked about the price of cars, especially we're talking about the price of a new car. Uh, the automobile industry is consumer centric. Consumers get out there, they've searched the internet, they know what a new car should cost. They knew what a new GMC Denali should cost. They know what a new Cadillac should cost, a new Honda. They understand all of that. With healthcare, it's it's not so much of an understanding. Uh, with healthcare, you are, again, goes back to asymmetric information. If, if it's an individual and I have my health plan with, with uh, Anthem. So Anthem sells benefit packages to a lot of people and they, they sell, I happen to purchase one that has a $10 copay. Most individuals that purchase this same or similar health plan or, or benefit package that I do, they see the $10 copay and to them, that's the cost of their health care visit. They don't understand that depending on how the provider bills the health plan, that visit could be three or four hundred dollars, depending on what kind of services they bill and how they bundle it together and package it. But for the individual, they go to the healthcare and what they pay out of pocket to them is the price that that visit costs them in dollars out of pocket. And it's to them, it's ten dollars, which <clears throat> It may not be, which definitely is not the case, but to them it is. And if you look at price elasticity of demand, close substitutes have a high price elasticity and complementary goods have a low price elasticity. So if, if you're looking at, at substitutes, so I go to see my primary care doc, um, then let's say my primary care doc charges the health plan <clears throat> hundred dollars for my visit i can go to uh, a primary care i can go to an urgent care and let's say that urgent care um, only cost me 75 dollars they're close enough for me close enough substitutes i may just decide to go to um, the primary care visit or i may decide to go to the urgent care visit instead of the primary care doc visit depends on time and some other factors but gives you an idea of of elasticities. So elasticity is going to be affected by substitutes. It's going to be affected by, you know, the complements they have. There's also an income elasticity. So higher income proportion goods have a high elasticity. And it says high prices curtail consumption of other consumer goods. And that makes sense because if you're spending more of your budget, so my wife and I have a, a budget. And out of that budget comes uh, comes housing expenses, comes food, clothing, transportation, insurance, health care. All of that comes out of the out of our budget. And if you have a higher portion of your budget going to health care, then it's it just it just makes sense. It's going to take dollars away from some other. Uh, good or service that you could have purchased. And so that's why we, we talk about higher income goods have a high elasticity. And so most individuals want to curtail the number of dollars that go out the door to medical care. Um, thinking about you know high cost procedures, um, liability of insurance. Um, a lot of health plans have gone to a tiered pharmaceutical type benefits. So um, you, you find yourself, especially depending on how risk averse you are as a consumer, uh, you may find yourself rather than going with a high deductible plan where it's going to cost you less on premium, but you're going to pay more out of pocket or coinsurance 
um, are high deductible, again, you're going to pay more out of pocket. You may decide if you think you're going to have a lot of health care issues on the horizon, you may decide to take that $10 copay, or in some cases, there's plans out there that are $0 copays. And again, you're talking about higher proportion, it's, you know, impacts the the elasticity of demand of those healthcare goods and services. And you see a lot of uh, health plans going to, and I mentioned earlier, these tiered pharmaceuticals. So you've got tier one, and tier one may be a $5 copay. You've got tier two, tier two may be a $50 copay. And then you've got tier three, and tier three may, a, may be a, you know, 35% of bill charge. And so health plans will put your lower cost uh, pharmaceuticals down in tier one because, you know, it doesn't cost you much. It doesn't cost the plan much. For tier two that you're paying 50 bucks for, it's kind of your intermediate. And for tier three, because you're paying a percent of bill charge on that tier, they're going to put their high cost, their high cost pharmaceuticals down here on that tier three. And so you as the consumer, and again, it's impacting your budget and it's also impacting elasticities of demand. It's going to, you're going to try to curtail uh, any type of pharmaceutical that sits down here on this tier three. You're actually going to try to curtail anything that sits on tier two because you'd rather pay a $10 copay than a $50 copay. So just remember that elasticity of demand is going to, especially price elasticity of demand, it's going to um, have a significant impact on how you view your healthcare goods and services. And when they talk about the number of alternative substitutes impacts elasticities, think of all, and I'll just use Nashville as an example, think of all of the hospitals in Nashville. You've got well, across the street from Fish, you've got Meharry Medical Center. Um, seemed like I saw a TRICARE, there's St. Thomas, I know there's Vanderbilt. Uh, you've got and I don't know the number of hospitals in, uh, say, Nashville's in Davidson County. I don't know the number of hospitals in Davidson County, and I sure don't know the number of hospitals in like that metro Nashville area. But not only are there a number of hospitals in that metro Nashville area, but think of all of the different physicians in Nashville, in the metro Nashville area. If you're an older individual, think of all the different types of um, long care options. You've got nursing homes. You've got uh, long-term acute care facilities. Um, think of the uh, the home care opportunities. If you don't want to uh, go to the hospital or you, or you don't want to go to uh, some kind of a nursing home, think of the number of alternatives you've got in home care so you can live in your home and still receive care. And then also think about outpatient surgery. You go in to see your physician and that individual says, you know, hey, we need to, to do a total knee replacement on you. And, you know, you've got the option of going into the hospital and, you know, to an inpatient stay, or you've got the option of going into um, an outpatient surgery and I'll do the surgery there and we'll send you home with a physical therapist and you won't ever have to go to um, a hospital or a rehab. And from my perspective, that's the option I'm going to take because, you um, I, I just don't want to have to go to a hospital and I sure don't want to have to go to a rehab facility. And we're also, when we're looking at price elasticity of demand, there's a time, time cost is value of time allocated to an activity. There, you know, time and money cost. Again, when I gave you the example of going to see my physician, you know, I've got the wear and tear on the car. I've got the cost of driving it down there. I've got, you know, the parking charge. And then I've got the cost of my time because I value my time. As a consultant, you have to value your time. Or think about, you know, where you work. If you're working somewhere and it's, you know, 50 bucks an hour and you don't have a really generous, um, I guess, medical type benefit that allows you to take some, you know, some medical leave to run to the doctor's office, you know, you may you may forego going to the doctor's office because you can't afford it. You want to stay at work and work. And the higher your wage rate is, the less likely you want to take off time to go see a, a to, to go to the doctor's office. And those type of things bias price elasticities. 
waiting for an appointment, again, travel time, travel spent in the doctor's office, lost time at work, all of those are going to bias your, your, you know, your price elasticities. And the higher the time cost, and again, as we talked about, the higher the wage rates, the higher the opportunity cost for time. So again, you think you're thinking about, even though you don't think about it as opportunity cost per se, but when you're trying to decide whether to, I don't want to say waste time, if you're trying to decide whether to allocate time to go into a doctor's office and spending two or three hours out of your day, you are looking at opportunity cost because you're calculating in your mind, here's my wage rate and here's what it's going to cost me. Here's what it could cost me in downtime. So again, it goes back to uh, decisions at the margin, self-interest and opportunity cost. And all of this, even though you may not um, specifically think that's what you're doing, those are the decisions that, that are spiraling through your mind as you go through the process. Uh, let's see, have I missed anything? Um, oh, one other one other concept that they do that that they do uh, mention in the text is opportunity costs are going to be different depending on the type of health plan you have. If you have private if you have private health insurance or you have health insurance that you bought as a private individual through the marketplace, you are more than likely employed, and that insurance may be, uh, if, especially if it's private health insurance, it's going to be employer-based. If it's employer-based, it's going to be provided by your employer. And so that would imply that you have a job and you have a wage rate that you're balancing against your opportunity costs. If you think about individuals um, that are retired, retirees, you're thinking about an indigent population, you're thinking about individuals maybe on Medicaid, they may not have a wage rate that they have to worry about when they're calculating opportunity costs because they may not be working. And to them, the opportunity cost of going to a physician may not be as great as your opportunity cost because you have a wage rate in mind that you're balancing against your opportunity cost. And to a certain extent, individuals in the Medicare, Medicaid, indigent population, whether it's you know providers accept Medicare, whether they accept Medicaid or they're going to a community clinic, they may be viewed as a drain on the healthcare goods and services available to everybody because they aren't concerned about that opportunity cost. Also, insurance coverages increase the value of time. Time becomes a larger factor of total cost. In seeking medical care, providers to use time costs are more important than money cost in healthcare. And I think from my, I know from my perspective, the time cost for me is much more important than the $10 copay that I'm going to pay for going to the doctor. It's more important to me than wear and tear on the car, the gas, the parking, and that $10 copay I'm paying to go to the, see my health care provider. My time costs are more valuable to me than bundling all of the other costs together. And that's where they're talking about um, time costs are more important than money costs in general for most individuals in health care. And then lastly, we're going to talk about aggregate demand for healthcare goods and services. And they they run through uh, some some global uh, information. Um, you know, they talk about positive correlation between income and demand for healthcare, uh, and that's we we've, we've talked about in the past. Uh, they use linear regression when I say they. We're talking about I should have said we when I talk about economists. We use linear regression. Uh, Gross domestic product um, explains 92% and the variance that they ran a study on 13 countries and looking at um, correlation between you know, GDP and the demand for health care. Newer research where they're looking at time series, panel data properties, methodologies, provide kind of inclusive results as, as to how much there's a correlation between the demand for health care and GDP. Uh, we also talked about earlier about income elasticities. That's the percent change in the quantity demanded for a percent change in income. Um, normal good 
it's it's positive but it's less than one a superior good is greater than one and an inferior good it's negative and again going back to your to your micro classes when you talked about normal superior inferior goods and you know the the demand for those goods have a move is this is income um changes in income increases or decreases and <clears throat> They, they finally decide healthcare tends to be either a normal good or a superior good. And then lastly, to kind of wind this up, um, the, the text talks about the demand for healthcare is driven by age, education, income, and health status. And that's something that I don't want to say we've talked about on na ad nauseum, but we've, we've touched on all of these um, articles or touched on all of these parameters or all of these factors as we've gone through both the demand for health and the demand for healthcare. And I'm not sure what the next uh, chapter is going to be about, but that's going to wind things up when we're talking about the demand for healthcare. And the next time you see me, we will jump into uh, the next chapter in Dewar's book and uh, move forward as, as we go down our, our trek and, and talk about um, healthcare and in and, and the, you know, health economics, and we'll get a little deeper into uh, some of the, the methodologies used and essentially down the road somewhere along the way, we're going to talk about hospitals and the labor market for healthcare goods and services, but a lot of topics yet to cover, and but that's going to wind it up for today's discussion of demand for healthcare. Talk to everybody soon. Thanks for joining.